Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. And thank you, uh, Brad and Julie, for uh, your uh, insights, uh, Brad, especially in the conversation that uh, we are going to have today. You really set the stage. Um, I think uh, you set some things that uh, we'll probably be looking at throughout the day. Um, influence of technology, the fact that uh, more remote working, uh, everybody's doing that these days, the need for data, the challenge of this digital divide, investing in employee training, a lot of um, important factors here as we are dealing with the new situation in uh, our world today. Well, I'd like to introduce now our uh, panel members. Uh, Phyllis Campbell, Chair of the Pacific Northwest J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Also with us is Dennis Hayes, President and CEO of the Bullet Foundation. And Michelle Merriweather, President and CEO, Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. We are also going to be taking up these questions that uh, we laid out for Brad. I'd also, uh, if there's, there's things that Brad said there, panel members, that uh, you want to weigh in on and, and expand on, uh, please do so. Um, we know we're in, these, uh, we're in this unprecedented time right now of dealing with uh, two pandemics, and that is the COVID-19 and obviously the pandemic of racism as well. So with that in mind, um, you know, I'd, I'd like each one of you to kind of touch on that, but also um, as we take up again these questions that we're posing, uh, the four questions, and let's begin with the first question, what adjustments have we made that we should continue to make? But let's do it in the context of what we're facing today. And Phyllis, if we could start with you, that would be great. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Enrique, and, and certainly thanks to uh, Jean Duvernoy and uh, the Earth Day Committee. And I just want to say it's just an honor to be part of this. And I think it has been, has been referenced before to be with you, Enrique, but also to be with Dennis Hayes, who is an icon in our community as we've celebrated 50 years of his founding of Earth Day. And then Michelle met Merriweather to be on a panel with you as such a leader in so many areas, um, particularly in the, the racial equity and justice uh, movement that we're in. So maybe I could just answer the question, Enrique, briefly by recapping a couple themes that Brad touched on and the governor touched on, because I think they're really important to keep in mind. And the governor said, obviously, um, racial justice or climate justice, you know, however you want to frame it, is the lens that I think we need to have these conversations in. And I think that's a very important and uh, front and center issue for all of us. So I really hope that we, as we go through the discussions today and uh, in early August and think about the blueprint and report, that we have really used the whole climate justice and um, certainly equity lens as uh, something that's really important. And, you know, I think something hopefully that will frame um, everything that we talk about. The second thing I think that Brad said that, or the, the second thing that struck me that Brad talked about was the, the use of data and the governor touched on it as well. And I think if we've learned something in this COVID crisis to me, it's that data matters. Yes, science matters as the governor said, but data in the sense that we as a community need to track and, and measure everything that we do, whether it's on the sustainability side with climate change or whether it's healthcare uh, access, public health access, or whether it's uh, disease trends, whether it's um, you know food insecurity, whatever it is, I, I really hope that we wrap this together with the idea that science and data matters and how do we as a community use this opportunity to come together with a set of eyes on things that are important to us. And probably the last thing, Enrique, I'll just respond to that Brad said that I'd like to come back to, maybe in our later part of our panel, is just the idea of really thinking big. You know, tackle big challenges, have big ambitions. And I don't only think about that in terms of our goal for sustainability and um, certainly the clean energy future that we're all looking towards, but also around the things that uh, we'll need to do that challenge us, such as infrastructure rebuild, such as um, education. I mean, all the things that I think will lead to jobs and economic prosperity. So thank you. 
Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, a lot of good points there, especially going big. All right, uh, Michelle Merriweather, uh, I'd like to have you weigh in. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. And it's an honor to be here to share the stage with such phenomenal human beings. Um, I agree, uh, it is time that we start to think big. And I think what COVID uh, taught us is that we can be flexible and we can think big at the same time. What I would love to see um, that we sustain and continue in this is um, thinking first about our most vulnerable populations and putting them first as we think about um, what we continue. We did that quickly through COVID. We're doing that now as we reckon um, with uh, our country's uh, injustices and treatment towards race and, and dealing with racism. And we've called it out and we, um, and we are acknowledging it. And I hope that we continue to do that and continue to take bold, um, drastic measures uh, to change the system. Um, and I think the last thing I think we need to continue to do is to, um, if we put our health and uh, health first and our economy will follow. And I think that uh, in this region, we're starting to do that. And, you know, I think other cities are starting to follow suit. You know, hopefully our, our federal government will catch up, but I think um, us, putting our health first and, and, and following the um, recommendations of our public health uh, leaders, uh, our economy will follow and will recover strongly. Wear a mask, wash your hands. Dennis Enrique. Hayes. Hi, Enrique. Well, let me share with everyone else my pleasure at being here with this wonderful group of, of folks. Uh, three broad categories, one COVID, two response to Brad, and three just a couple notes about something I'd like to talk about later. Uh, with regard to COVID, most people have been drawing some relatively upbeat lessons from it. Uh, and I, I, I think I would like to uh, tap that down just a little bit. Uh, I, I wasn't around during World War II, which I know will come as a surprise to at least some of you who assume I probably was around for the Spanish-American War. Uh, but I have this mythological thing with we really pulled together. I mean, we had an attack upon the United States and then suddenly everyone was sacrificing, planting their victory gardens, recycling everything, signing up to go fight abroad. And I assumed that when we found ourselves in a similar crisis, now there would be a similar sort of response. And uh, the voluntary responses, while they've certainly been there and it's been a good cross section of the country, has not been anywhere near the level that I had hoped for. Um, the use of masks and social distancing is, it's a voluntary thing, uh, but it has not been sufficient to turn down the curve. And um, uh, in general, I, I had really hoped that behavioral change would come. My sense is that one of the lessons from this is that maybe we need to rely more upon uh, policy changes, uh, legal changes, technological innovations, the metaphor there being vaccines or in the other instance, solar energy efficiency devices. In any case, behavior, and, and, and admittedly, we had Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, and we do not emphatically have Franklin Roosevelt leading the country today, but, but it, it has been a disappointing response. The second is that a very large number of people don't seem to be willing to act unless it benefits them personally. Uh, populations that view themselves as being at very low risk have engaged in behavior that constitutes a very high risk to others. That too has just been an enormous disappointment. With regard to Brad, uh, I think the, the principal lessons that I'd take, uh, both from his comments, but even more so from the commitments that Microsoft has made under his leadership, are one that we have reached the stage where truly bold actions are essential. Uh, everyone has been waiting for the last few decades for someone else to make this issue a top priority and Microsoft really stepped up to the plate on climate and made it by far the, the strongest commitment made by any corporation of its stature. Second, uh, the private sector, just like the public sector, has been viewing the climate crisis for a long time as a looming crisis. And I think there's now a recognition that it's not looming anymore, it, it's here and that there are many more decades of disaster that are already baked into the system. And so we can't continue to just pay this rhetorical uh, uh, attention, but, but really need to move. 
Third is that while lofty goals for 2050 and 2100 are well and good, what really matters is what we're going to do today and next year and by 2025 and by 2030. Uh, Microsoft, I think, is the only massive corporation in the world that has pledged to be carbon negative by 2030. And that's a timetable that means that you are really moving immediately in really a dramatic fashion. And then uh, finally, it's that if you lead boldly, others will follow. And the whole technology community, the major players in it, uh, Microsoft, Apple this week has made a huge commitment with regard to the same things comparable to Microsoft's. And similarly, Amazon, and Google have all been working. I would say all of those companies have been much more bold in their actions toward climate than any government in the world has been. And I think that's sort of a responsibility for those of us on this call. Governments respond to what is demanded of them. And if we're going to be getting some powerful action where governments are beginning similarly to move boldly, it's going to be because we cause them to move boldly. I have a whole list of brief items that later on in this conversation I would like to uh, call up to, to prompt the breakout groups with what some bold actions might mean for the cities of Seattle. Uh, and the main reason I wanted to mention it now is that looking at all of those faces on the screen in front of me, I realized that the majority of these things I'm gonna say, I, I actually cribbed from somebody else who was on this call. So let me apologize in advance that I've got enough of these items, I'm not gonna say who first suggested it to me, but this represents a, a little bit of a, uh, pulse taking across the environmental community of things that folks would like to see. All right, Dennis, thank you very much. Um, and speaking of uh, taking notes from other folks, uh, how about uh, questions that you might have? You can uh, send me some questions and we'll hopefully have time to work in here. You can uh, do it through the uh, chat uh, system here and uh, we will hopefully have time to work those into the conversations. Let's move on to the next uh, question. Uh, and that is uh, what challenges have been exposed that we need to address? I think Dennis laid out a bunch, but Michelle, why don't we start with you? Michelle? Yeah, uh, yeah sorry. Um, I think the, the biggest challenges for me from where I sit um, are uh, as Brad called out, the technological divide and, and the implications that it has had on uh, the people that we serve at the Urban League in particular and Black Washingtonians across the state, our young people especially, the last four months, five months, um, uh, and, and going into the fall, uh, have um, been lost for many of the people that we serve. So. Um, uh, we are truly in the, the, the technolo technology revolution and how we support those that do not have access. Uh, adults and young, uh, young people alike are uh, one of those um, big challenges. Uh, I will also agree with Brad that policing is also one of the major challenges, is, is especially um, impacting our community. While I don't use the term defund, um, I don't use the term reform either. Big changes need to be made and they need to be drastic. Uh, and we need to all come together uh, to identify what those changes will be and how they can be sustainable. And that's gonna take time and planning and all of us coming together um, and making those hard decisions together as, uh, as a community and listening and putting those voices of those that have been harmed um, at the center of those discussions. Uh, and, at, and, uh, and the last is unemployment that disproportionately impacts the black community, indigenous community and people of color and um, training uh, uh, and providing training and education and tools and resources to those um, that have been disproportionately impacted for those jobs of the future. So if we're thinking about um, climate change and green jobs, how can we, uh, and environmental sustainability, how can um, the people that we serve be connected to those opportunities and be trained and prepared um, for, those, um, for those opportunities? You're, you're on mute, Enrique. Sorry, Phyllis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I won't go over what Michelle went over because that was a great list. I'm gonna maybe approach it from your 
to your question from a slightly different lens, Enrique, and talk a little bit about what Brad said about Challenge Seattle, which I think is shows a great strength in our community, but it also, I think, is exposed to weakness during this crisis, and I'll, I'll sort of mention this under the umbrella of culture. So I think, um, you know, for those of you that don't know Challenge Seattle, it was a group of a lot of us employers, major employers in the region. You know, now as Brad said, the, this has become a big community square with a lot of employers and public officials and a lot of the um, civil society sector, nonprofits and every, a lot of folks calling in twice a week and really talking about how we manage through the COVID crisis. And the original uh, purpose of Challenge Seattle was to ask ourselves, how do we stay and become an even more uh, prosperous uh, global player in the in the world community? And so, you know, using that lens, I think we've achieved a lot together, working together and through the crisis, you know, this has been a real opportunity. But to your question, Enrique, about the weaknesses that have been exposed, I think what we've seen is what a little bit of what Brad said, look, we should have been so much better prepared for this health crisis that came upon us quickly. We as companies and public sector and nonprofit sector were kind of shocked about the lack of cooperation and the lack of data on where, were, where was the PPE? How do we actually track uh, where COVID is spreading quickly and how do we get on it? And we were caught so flat footed and, you know, compared to, as he said, Japan and South Korea and so many other countries that uh, really have managed this crisis so much better. You know, we realize that we really, though we have a culture of cooperation and I think a desire to work together, we're so fragmented. We're fragmented still as companies. We're fragmented uh, with different governments. We're fragmented with different hospital healthcare systems. We're fragmented uh, in the environmental and sustainability side. So I think part of the lesson, if I would say, is you know, the weakness to your question is that, you know, we've got a lot more to do in um, the cooperative spirit, but not just a spirit, which is a great part of this community and our culture, but how do we actually, actually, you know, kind of bring our systems and processes together so that we put a set of eyes that I don't think uh, this crisis, uh, you know, showed our best side, to be honest. Dennis. Sure. Um... <clears throat> I, I would highly recommend to anyone that hasn't read it, Michael Lewis's book called The Fifth Risk. It points out what we were prepared to do in the closing days of the Obama administration, the transition plans, the documents that have been set up, the, the, um, the deep state people with enormous skill who were there ready to pick up the things that they'd been doing before and carrying them through and how that was systematically destroyed over the course of the first several months of this administration. I, I agree, we would have had a rough time with this, uh, given some of the peculiarities of the American political system and American culture under any circumstances. But uh, I, I can't imagine a bigger failure than the failure that has come out of Washington, D.C. in terms of addressing this problem. Just a mistake after mistake after mistake and a refusal to acknowledge it when it happens. Uh, back, back to the climate issue and the huge issue of inequality. I, I'd, I'd simply point out that when we've had massive structural changes, if, if you will, the, the things we call revolution, uh, the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the digital revolution, uh, the, these things that are so sweeping, they almost invariably result in a greater concentration of wealth in a smaller set of hands. Before the agricultural revolution, you didn't have pharaohs and people building pyramids. You didn't have kingdoms. You didn't have all of that. Before the industrial revolution, there were no titans. There were no Rockefellers and Fords. Uh, before the digital revolution, you didn't have this thing where 40 families now control more wealth than the poorest half of mankind. Uh, the upcoming shifts with regard to changing the entire global economy from one that runs virtually entirely on fossil fuels to one that doesn't burn any fossil fuels in a relatively swift period of time is, is going to be possibly the most sweeping change that our species has ever experienced. And if history is a guide, it will lead to even greater concentrations. Um, and we have to make sure that whatever we do, that doesn't happen. I have this uneasy feeling that we are in an almost proto-revolutionary kind of status right now. You, you look at some of the urban disturbances and uh, 
and, and the fury that is out there is, is understandable and it is representative of in the eyes of those who are dispossessed, a, a total lack of legitimacy in the industrial sector, in the government, in, in all aspects of the society. And part of that is just, it's <laughs> fundamentally unfair for one person last week to see his fortune increased by $25 billion at a time when so much of America uh, has lost their jobs. So we, we have to address that inherently as part of bringing about the changes. All right, let's move on to our uh, next question uh, so we can also have time for some questions from our uh, from the folks that are involved here. What do we learn from this experience that will help us work toward equity, undo institutional racism, and, envi and advance environmental justice? Uh, Phyllis, I'll start with you. Sure, well, thanks. Um, so I, I think everybody has already said it, and maybe picking up on Dennis's uh, last point is, you know, I really would hope that out of this uh, get together this, uh, you know, particularly the breakout groups that, again, going back to the point about using uh, equity as the lens that we look through environmental and sustainability issues as, I think that that's a big one, right? So I, I think that's really what we're learning right now is we cannot have this discussion without talking specifically about disparities, who's being left behind. And so I really think, and I would hope that um, this blueprint and report will squarely address the issues of not just um, environment, air, clean air, clean water, which is obviously still very, very front and center, but access to healthy food. Um, I think Brad mentioned even affordable housing and uh, the whole COVID crisis has told us that healthcare access to particularly public healthcare services is becoming more acute that there's less money to go around. And I think as Dennis said, or, you know, particularly our federal government, there's no response there. So what is the lens? I, I would say that's really the biggest thing for me is just keep asking ourselves, what is the lens? What are the disparities? What are the things that we as a community need to squarely look at, um, particularly for our black, brown, and indigenous populations? So I really hope, Enrique, that you know, I don't have the answers. I certainly have had a lot of learning myself. I will say, even being a woman of color who was born and raised in the state, I've had to learn and, you know, really ask myself, how do I think about these things? How do I reframe every question under the lens of equity, disparity, and access? And so I think the sustainability uh, frame is such a big frame and it overlays all of these issues. Thank you, Phyllis. I actually hope everybody kind of takes stock of what we're uh, dealing with right now and start to look at how equity is important in our society. I'm going to go to Dennis next. Dennis? Uh, well, I, I should say that this is um, an issue on which someone like me needs to be more listening than talking. Um, as an older white guy, um, I, I, until just this last year, the concept of reparations. So what in the world? I, I had nothing to do with that. My ancestors had nothing to do with that. Why, why do I need to pay something to somebody for something that happened 300 years ago? Um, and I've come to understand that reparations means a vast number of great things. There has been an historic injustice and there have to be ways that that, that gets redeemed. Uh, and I don't know what they are, but I'm, I'm wide open and eager to listen and come up with creative solutions that move us forward in a much more equitable fashion. The, the one thing that I might say to broaden the conversation just a little bit is that uh, those who um, come out at the short end of the stick consistently are those that do not have resources to begin with and hence can't afford uh, strong legal representation when there's going to be a um, a polluting facility or a freeway cutting through their neighborhood or who don't have real access to political power. Um, when you think in those terms, the, the ultimate example is somebody who will not be born for a hundred years. Uh, the, the equity here has to be dealing with something that's paying attention to the world that we're going to be leaving to our grandchildren and our great grandchildren as well. And I'm hopeful that that will become an important part of every question that we move forward with as a 
as a part of this dialogue. Michelle. Uh, thank you, David, for that. That kind of um, leads me to, to what I was thinking. Um, when, this, when the civil unrest started, I, we, a group of us kind of thought, what is, what is our protest? And so we went to philanthropy and, and um, sort of demanded that they look at the Black community across the state, the 261,000 Black Washingtonians, and how we can give um, um, an elevate voice and resources directly, intentionally to that community, um, where we're about 4% uh, of the population across the state, but overrepresented in all of the problem areas, be it incarceration, health issues, um, economic insecurity, food insecurity, and um, how, and we, we launched the Black Future Co-op Fund to, uh, to ask philanthropy or demand of philanthropy and uh, to, to see us, hear us, and invest in us um, uh, intentionally. And it is working, and I, I, I want to um, challenge as we start to think of, um, start thinking big on how we can um, sort of transfer this into policy. And if we call it reparations, I call it a new social contract with, uh, with the Black residents and those that have been most harmed, Black and Indigenous residents and those that have been most harmed in, um, in systemic racism and the things that uh, our, our society has um, placed on, um, on those that have, uh, have less. Um, a new social contract that that intentionally invest in those communities and in every area and everything that we um, start to develop and think of how it will uh, improve the lives of those that, uh, that, that come after us, the generations to follow. That's the goal of the Black Future Co-op Fund to ensure that it changes the generation and that we are good ancestors for those that come after us. And so I challenge all of us to think of how we will be good ancestors to those that come um, behind us and, and, and start thinking about uh, the things that we put in place now uh, will have those long implications for our children, our children's children and beyond. Enrique, I know you're asking the questions, but you have an opinion on this too, so I'm going to there turn go. the table and ask you. <laughs> Well, I, I think what's really important, I think Dennis said something for everybody, and that is to listen, which we don't seem to do very well these days. Um, we tend to spend so much time in our camps uh, griping, and I admit I'm right there with you, uh, but I really think listening is a very important part of things. And I also think that, um, I, I remember we had our first conversation before we did this panel, I mentioned about how uh, I wish that the racial justice movement, the way it has gotten the response now had happened about 30 years ago when I was a bit younger. Um, but I'm glad to see it happen now. I just hope that it won't be co-opted by a lot of things that we really, and, and I'm really glad to see so many young people get involved here. But I think, you know, it's going to be incumbent on all of us to really um, say that this is important and that, you know, we, got, we really need to look at ourselves and understand why there's a call for reparations, understand why essential workers, farm workers, my people are out there and their lives every day are being risked to give us food. We need to look at that. There was a great front line that aired the other night about this. Educate yourself, be aware, talk to other people, wear a mask, wash your hands. You know, if we don't, if we don't just really make some efforts here, we're, I hate to say we're doomed, but we're sure going to be in a hell of a, hell of a you know, problem. So I just, I just, I'm tired of the divisions. I think for us to make any type of progress in any area, that we're going to have to sit down and try to get along. And that's uh, the biggest thing, I think, more than anything else. Um, you know, I want to, we have so little time left, but, you know, Dennis, you mentioned a few things that you wanted to just touch on, and I'd, I'd like you to, to come back to you. Okay, well, I, I will try to summarize these 
and, and leave out a fair number of them just because, as you say, we do have limited time. But here are a few things that, uh, again, to address the climate issue and the sustainability and resilience would be uh, bold in the same sort of sense that I think that Microsoft has been bold in the private sector and that we might want to try in, in the public sector. For one, how about banning internal combustion engines from a portion of downtown Seattle by 2025 and develop a plan to grow that area every year into the future. The sidewalks and streets being leased to outside restaurants and shops probably would require a small fleet of electric buses and delivery vans to serve that free area, but, but uh, I, I think it would be a huge step in the right direction with the other steps um, fairly obvious as you expand it. Second, we have to dramatically tighten the city's energy code for buildings. Uh, the Bullet Center uses one-fourth as much energy per square foot as a building like it built to code, which gives you some sense of what the technical possibilities are. And we're now seven years old. We could do a much better job today. Um, and we have to do something as well about all of the buildings that are already there that were built because Seattle has had really cheap electricity and really cheap natural gas. So most of the existing building stock is dreadfully inefficient. As we're moving into this new era, we need to figure out ways to get that retrofitted. Uh, and there are some things, including a, a very bold program that has now been started for 20 buildings by Seattle uh, City Light uh, called Energy Efficiency as a Service. And we need to be capitalizing on that and other things that will, you know, we, we, we replace 2% of our buildings per year and we can get that 2% with tight energy codes. We've still got 98% that we have to deal with that are not being built now. And that's, that's the issue for the next 20 years is going to be dominated by retrofits. Uh, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways provided a map of 130 miles of streets that could be separated into lanes for pedestrians and bicyclists and ultra small electric vehicles. Seattle has now closed 20 miles with exceptions for local traffic. Bold would be a whole lot closer to that 130 uh, with any exceptions to it being really stringent and really enforced. Uh, Vancouver, British Columbia has something that is a formal transportation mode hierarchy. And every time that they bypass a higher rated mode to invest in a lower rated mode, I have to have a really compelling rationale for uh, that is something that makes the individual uh, automobile uh, at the lowest mode. And you, you have to really build a compelling case to do anything that builds a new street. Uh, Paris is leading the way toward planning process that incentivizes 15 minute neighborhoods with the goal for everyone to live within a safe, 15 minute walk or bicycle ride of all essential goods and services. We need a really serious program to grow and maintain the urban canopy with ambitious goals for very large trees that will sequester huge amounts of carbon, provide shade, clean the air, thrive in the warmer temperatures that are now coming and resist the pests that are now coming. Uh, Dennis, I'm going to jump in on you here just so I can get uh, a question in from the audience. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. fine. All right. You can share your list with us. Please do. Um, you know, one, uh, I've gotten several questions really about broadband and how do we expand that to make sure, and particularly in communities of color, uh, where there are limitations, and I think in rural areas as well. Suggestions there? Where? Uh, what can we can do? I, uh, can I jump in, Enrique, because I actually yeah. think that it gets back to the big ambition and the things that Brad Smith challenged us on. There's actually some talk now, and this is a question that this group may grapple with, about potential um, state capital budget uh, bonding authority to look at big ambition projects with potentially a green lens. So talk about potential green bonds that we might issue. So that has a little bit different connotation with protecting our lands and maybe looking at more green build ideas that Dennis is talking about. But if we really thought creatively and thought about big ambitions with broadband, you know, there are some things that can be done if we really thought creatively with state capital budget authority. And I know right now the operating budget is, is a mess and it's gonna be difficult to get money. But I think if you thought creatively about public-private partnerships. We thought about uh, using state capital budget authority with some um, you know, co companies like Microsoft, CenturyLink, and others that are looking at this. Actually think, again, putting the ambition out there and really thinking about it, as you say, in a 
in an equitable way? How do we get broadband to the most vulnerable populations and the most underserved communities in the state? So I would just say, uh, you don't have an answer, but I, this is where we have to think big, think differently, and not think about how we've done things in the past. And I love the idea that's being kicked around now about these uh, potential you know, bonds that might be used for something very different that will help us in the recovery. Right. I'm going to ask, uh, just to wrap up, I'm going to ask each one of you to, to kind of give me just some quick suggestions or what you see that to motivate folks, uh, I guess, to care about what we're dealing with today, what types of contributions they might be able to make, and maybe why it's important. Um, let me start with you, Michelle. I go back to a, a new social contract. We can we could be a model across the country um, for putting in writing and putting in detail how we care about our most vulnerable, our Black residents, our, our Indigenous residents, our um, Latinx communities that have been so um, pushed aside, left behind, and uh, ignored. Um, but if we uh, think broadly, think big, and and um, put it out there, just like King County calling a racism a public health crisis and, and putting um, money and resources behind it, just like we did in COVID, um, uh, we can truly be a model for the rest of the country. Dennis. Um, well, taking refuge in, in what is so often what we take refuge in, I, I, I think that leadership is going to be just incredibly important in this. Um, and ultimately, the, the city council, the King County Council, the executive, the mayor uh, need to find ways to communicate very emphatically and clearly what it is that they hope to get done this year, next year, in a three to five year kind of time frame in ways that people will look at and that they can build a consensus around that is really unstoppable. Uh, I, I, I've come to uh, really respect the Seattle process where you reach out and get everybody involved in your decision making. But that so often has turned into something that uh, in addition to getting everybody's perspectives considered just not only slows things down, but basically stops it uh, for any reasonable period of time. And, and with this, somehow we need to break through that, do consider everybody's perspectives and then move forward. Um, the, the, the issues now just don't have the, giving us the, the luxury of time to sit around <laughs> with, with every year that passes, we have that much more carbon in the atmosphere and it is going to be that much more difficult to stop. Phyllis. So the last wrap up idea I had, I'm just going to take from a comment I saw come over chat from Howard Frumkin. It was one of the things that I, I wanted to say, but I think we can be a model to the nation and not just the big ideas. But I would encourage people to think about what Howard said is, how do we think about employment and jobs coming out of this? So if it's, Howard said, broadband or you know, transit, if it's the, you know, the, the rail that Brad talked about or any other big things, how do we marry jobs, especially for, again, the most left behind folks out of this COVID crisis and certainly the race and equity crisis? So I just encourage people to really think about us as a model. We can do this. But let's not forget about the economic picture and the jobs that are going to be needed out there and the new opportunities for new jobs. Well, thank you very much. You guys have been great. Uh, I actually wish we had more time because I think uh, there's so much um, great insight that all of you have. And Dennis, uh, that list that you were reading off there, I hope that you will make sure that you share it. Of course. Uh, Jean and everybody, because I think that's very important for them to include in the in the blueprint. Uh, and my final words are: wash your hands, wear your mask, don't be dumb about this stuff. Um, and I say this because I have lost family members and friends to COVID, and I have cousins that uh, are also still suffering. And for the life of me, I can't understand why people just won't wear a mask. So that's my editorial comment for today. And I hope that you guys will all be examples out there. So just uh, take care of yourselves. Thank you again, everybody. Uh, you can uh, very shortly go into your breakout sessions where take all the insights that you've gotten here and make sure that uh, we're going to put together a good plan and blueprint going ahead. Have a great day and take care of yourselves and stay safe out there.